All right, guys, so we, we left off on this diagram that's really hard to see, and you don't have to know it for the AP exam, but it's just something that's nice to know. Okay, so I'm just going to go through it really quickly. Okay, so right here, here's our uh, low energy electron donor, our chlorophyll, the light energy comes in, here's the electron that's in the chlorophyll molecule, and then here's our high energy electron acceptor. Okay, so what's happening is that when the light energizes this electron in the chlorophyll molecule, the excited electron is then immediately passed, so here's the excited electron, it's then immediately passed um, to the electron acceptor, and then therefore it's what we call partially stabilized. So the positively charged chlorophyll molecule, this is supposed to be a, a plus sign there, okay? So the positively charged chlorophyll molecule will then attract the low energy electron from the electron donor, and that's why this yellow molecule then moves over to the, um, where the chlorophyll pigment is, okay? And then it will return to its resting state, okay? And then, so this right here creates a further charge separation, so to speak, okay? Because this is now, shoot, this is now positively charged, it's been oxidized, and then the, um, and this is the electron donor, and this is your electron acceptor that has, is negatively charged, and it's been reduced, okay? Um, and so then, when we get to part B, uh, the photo, in the photosynthetic reaction center, remember that's where we are, um, so this whole reaction center is restored to an original state, um, because it will acquire a new low energy electron, which is what this is, and then it will transfer the, oh shoot, you can't see it, let me stop moving the mouse. It will transfer the high energy electron derived from chlorophyll, so it's that, I don't want to move the mouse, but it's the orange blob right in that green um, area in the middle there, okay, and then so that high energy electron will then be transferred into the electron transport chain in the thylakoid membrane, okay? So basically, the ultimate source of the low energy electrons for photosystem 2, if we're, you know, because this is photosystem 2 that we're talking about, um, is water, okay? And so then light produces high energy electrons in the thylakoid membrane from low energy electrons in water. Right? So, in so I'll say it again. In conclusion, light produces high energy electrons in the thylakoid membrane from low energy electrons in water. Okay, so then here's our uh, diagram of the light dependent reactions, right? So here's our, this whole thing is the thylakoid. This is the thylakoid membrane, the lipid bilayer. Here's our thylakoid space, the dark gray area, and then the stroma on the outside, okay? That kind of fluid-like substance. So what's happening, um, the light will come in and hit one of the accessory pigments in the light harvesting complex of photosystem 2, and then that will cause the electrons to become excited and jump up to a higher energy state, um, and then that passes down through each of the, you know, like this electron becomes excited, jumps up, which causes this electron to become excited and jump up, causes this electron to come become excited and jump up, and so on and so forth, until the electrons are passed into the chlorophyll A molecules in the reaction center. But not only do we need light, but we also need water molecules. So then those water molecules are then going to split with the help of the energy from the light, will then split into oxygen, hydrogen protons, and electrons, and those electrons from the water are going to be donated to the chlorophyll, okay? And then um, those electrons in the chlorophyll become excited, and they will jump up, um, and then finally reach their, their electron acceptor, which in this case um, is going to be plastoquinone, okay? So then we... Well, and then in the process, our oxygen that was produced from the splitting of water will then be released as a byproduct, you know, out of the, the stomata of the cell leaf, okay? And then those hydrogen ions can then join um, the proton motive force to drive the synthesis of ATP. Um, and then in the process, though, so as these electrons are being transported between electron carriers, you know, across the cytochrome complex, um, and then finally into photosystem one, 
and then they reach their final electron acceptor, the ferrodoxin, uh, to where they can reduce NADP plus into NADPH. Um, this right here is the electron transport chain, right? But as that's happening, we're taking the hydrogen protons that come from the splitting of water molecule, and we're also taking the hydrogen protons that are um, sitting in the stroma. Those are also coming back down into the thylakoid space. And so then we're taking these hydrogen protons um, that will then uh, generate the proton motive force, right, or the electrochemical proton gradient. And so that, as those hydrogen ions are moving across the membrane, that's the process that we call chemiosmosis, right, is using the proton motive force to generate ATP, okay? Um, and so then, therefore, at the end of the light-dependent reactions, we have made NADPH and we've made ATP. And then these two energy molecules are what will enter into the Calvin cycle. Okay, so linear photophosphorylation, instead of oxidative phosphorylation, remember, produces ATP and NADPH. So we're going to get into the difference between linear pho photophosphorylation and then cyclic photophosphorylation. So in linear photophosphorylation, remember we have two photosystems, and in this case, my, my capital P, capital S is standing for photosystem, not photosynthesis. So we have two photosystems, photosystem two and photosystem one, and they work together in a series to energize an electron to a high enough energy state to be transferred all the way through the electron transport chain from water to NADPH. Okay, so as the electrons are transferred through, some of the energy is used to form ATP. So the electrons removed from the water and accepted by quinone pass their electrons to a hydrogen pump called cytochrome B6F complex. And you don't need to remember the name, but it's this one right here. Okay, cytochrome B6F complex, which then pumps the hydrogen ions into the thylakoid space resulting in a proton motive force that drives ATP synthesis, okay? And then finally, photosystem one will accept the electron in its energy deficient hole that was created by light in the chlorophyll molecule in its reaction center. So each electron that enters photosystem one is boosted to a high energy level that allows it to be passed to the iron sulfur center in ferrodoxin and then ultimately to NADP plus to generate NADPH, okay? And so this is where our ferrodoxin is, okay? Whoops, okay, so then your textbook gave you this diagram of linear electron flow um, and showing you kind of like how, how it works, so to speak, right? And so um, basically what's happening is, again, here's your photosystem two, here's your photosystem one. So we have light that comes in and you know, excites all of these electrons that get passed between pigments. We split a water molecule. The electrons that come from the water molecule then become excited and are passed on to their primary acceptor. Those electrons then travel down the electron transport chain where they get accepted by the cytochrome B6F complex. Well, when they're here, um, this will actually also allow the hydrogen protons to come through. And so when they get accepted by the cytochrome B6 complex, um, they, this will also pump your hydrogen ions into the thylakoid space, which then results in your proton motive force, okay? So in other words, this is a site of chemiosmosis, and so we can generate ATP, okay? And so then those electrons continue to travel down, and then when, they're, when they come into contact with photosystem one, they will become excited again until finally they reach their final electron acceptor, which is ferrodoxin, and then that will allow NADP plus to be reduced into NADPH. Okay, so this was the analogy that they gave you in your textbook, which is actually kind of cute. It's a mechanical analogy. So what it's telling you is that, okay, we have this guy over here. He slams a photon onto the seesaw. By doing that, it causes this electron to jump up to a higher mole um, molecular orbital or a higher energy state, okay? And so this is photosystem two. Well, then this electron gets passed down, but it's as, as it's getting passed down, 
it starts um, generating this mill to spin, okay? And so then as this mill is spinning, we're creating ATP. So that's the idea of chemiosmosis. So then the electron gets passed down to this sea salt. Well, then when, or teeter-totter. So then when this electron hits, um, we have another guy over here in photosystem one that uh, absorbs another photon. Okay, so when this photon is absorbed, it will smack the teeter-totter, which then causes this electron to jump up to a higher energy state. Okay, and then when it's jumped up to a higher energy state, it will then be... Um, accepted by ferrodoxin, which then travels into an NADP plus to reduce it to NADPH. So our final electron acceptor is our little bucket here, which is NADP plus, and then that creates NADPH. Okay, um, but, so we have linear flow, but we can also make ATP by cyclic photophosphorylation. Um, and so when we make ATP by cyclic photophosphorylation, that means that we can make ATP without making NADPH at all, okay? So as a reminder, in linear flow, the high energy electrons leaving photosystem two are harnessed to generate ATP. And then they're passed to photosystem one to drive the production of NADPH, okay? So this produces about one ATP molecule for every pair of electrons that are passed from water to generate an NADPH. But carbon fixation actually requires 1.5 ATP molecules per NADPH. So in order to produce the extra ATP that we need for the light independent reactions, the chloroplast can switch its photosystem one into a cyclic mode to produce the ATP instead of the NADPH. So what does that look like? Cyclic photophos photophosphorylation. So in cyclic photophosphorylation, um, the high energy electrons from photosystem one are transferred to cytochrome B6F complex instead of being passed to NADP plus, right? So they're passed back through the cytochrome complex. The electrons are then passed back to photosystem one at a low energy, and this results in more hydrogen ions to be pumped across the thylakoid membrane increasing the, the electrochemical proton gradient used to make ATP. So the important thing about cyclic photophosphorylation is that it involves only photosystem one, it involves only photosystem one, and it produces ATP without the formation of NADPH or oxygen. So again, cyclic electron flow uses only photosystem one and produces ATP, but not NADPH. And there's no formation of oxygen. It generates a surplus ATP, which then satisf satisfies the higher demand in the Calvin cycle, okay? So here's the picture of it, right? So the electrons that um, get passed to photosystem one, like after they've already been used to generate ATP, they'll get passed to photosystem one. And so basically what it's telling you is that instead of being accepted by ferrodoxin and then ultimately being reduced by NADPH, we can actually use those electrons again. So the electrons go back from photosystem one back into cytochrome B6F complex to where they can generate more ATP. And then the electrons go back into the photosystem one that way. And so that's what we call cyclic electron flow. Um, so here's our overview diagram. Again, I don't think we need to go over that again. Uh, so ATP and NADPH are produced on the side facing the stroma where the Calvin cycle takes place. So in summary, the light reactions generate ATP and increase the potential energy of electrons by moving them from water to NADPH. And that's our overview diagram, and I think that's where we're going to end. Oh, yes.